Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Eugene. Um, I'm going to talk about that. I come to you from Azavia, which is located in Philadelphia. Uh, there, our mission is to advance the state of the art in uh, geospatial technology and apply it for social, uh, civil, I always get those in the wrong order, environmental impact. Uh, in my engineer brain, that means uh, Use the map to do good, and uh, don't be afraid if you have to do something weird and a little bit challenging. Uh, so hopefully that's what this talk is about a little bit. Um, we can make this uh, an interactive talk. The results of this comparison are available at uh, demos.azavia.com. Uh, please feel free to go there and uh, check it out as I speak. Uh, it might give you some ideas and or questions. Uh, so what the hell am I talking about at a glance? Uh, sometime recently, uh, folks at Microsoft uh, did an awesome thing, uh, and they used the Bing Image Mosaic to extract uh, the building footprints using machine learning and uh, computational geometry techniques, and they published it for us as uh, GeoJSON files, aligned limited. We know that there is 125 million features of those guys. And if we just look at the building relationship in the OSM, we know that there is only 33 million of them. Uh, we kind of want to see where the intersection exists and what we can learn about that. Uh, why do we bother doing this? Uh, well, we started doing a more work with OSM at our company, and we're interested in kind of building the tool chain for working with OSM data at scale. Uh, in our work, uh, we're running into the usual questions about the map completeness uh, and possibly looking at them from the perspective of directed mapping. Even if we can't just take US buildings and dump them into OSM, well, what uh, can we say about where we can focus our efforts? So, completeness. Uh, this is my hometown, Philadelphia, and this is a pretty usual pattern uh, that we'll see. The dense urban core is very well mapped. Uh, purple is where we have a match for both uh, OSM and Bing building. Uh, you'll see later how that happens. Uh, the orange are the few places where uh, OSM uh, has a building that is not matched in the Bing data set, and the light blue are the remaining that were not matched in the OSM. Uh, as you kind of zoom out and include the suburbs, uh, the scale of this uh, gets uh, much more daunting, all those little suburbs, I'm guessing nobody really wants to map, and why would you? Um, except uh, when you get to Massachusetts, uh, which stands uh, very distinct. Um, OSM Wiki tells me that in 2012, uh, MassGIS performed a buildings import. Uh, the reasoning there was is like, hey, uh, this is basically an open record. Uh, we were paid by taxpayers. Isn't this a wonderful way for us to expose it as an open data data set? Uh, and they did it, and I agree with them. I think this is an awesome way of doing that. Uh, as you scroll around through the country, you will see other patches of these kind of large area matches. So this is happening uh, continuously, but this is probably the biggest geographic area where that happened. Uh, you still see there are some speckles of orange, and we can learn a little bit from that as well, right? So this seems like well-covered area with uh, a couple of orange buildings that only present in OSM, and it's kind of easy to see why. Uh, you can't see a building when it's uh, under a dense tree canopy, no matter how good your machine learning algorithm is. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm guessing these were also products of the MassJS import, because I don't know who maps sheds. Um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, we have one. W was it you? <laughs> All right, uh, this one's a fun one. Uh, crop circles. Uh, if you look at, uh, which one is this? Uh, Raleigh, right? Notice the ring of orange around the city. These are the buildings that are in OSM, kind of in the urban area, not in Bing. Weird. Uh, again, around Baltimore. Kind of zoom in so they're more pronounced. And Los Angeles gets four of these guys. Uh, so experts on Twitter tell me that what happened here is that the Bing mosaic basically has the seams where the low resolution imagery is overlaid with the high resolution imagery. And right at those seams, uh, whatever algorithm they use 
kind of went for a walk and didn't find any buildings there. It's not uh, easy to see if you're just looking at the Bing data, you're gonna see the empty spaces, which could be roads, but here, yeah, there they are. All right, so that was uh, the tour. Uh, let's talk about the technology between this uh, for this thing. Uh, this is all done um, using open source tools, and the project is itself uh, is open source at that repository. There is more detailed information there. Please take a look if you're so inclined. Uh, the reason I kind of want to talk about this is because I think the general workflow is kind of adaptable beside the specific problem and has some legs. Um, we start, so we're looking at this as a cluster compute problem. We're doing this at scale, whatever that means. So we're using Apache Spark. Uh, it's a library for distributing computing. What does that actually mean? Uh, we can write a program that runs on a machine. Uh, this program can bring up a number of workers and communicate with them to distribute the workload. And if they have to, they can rebalance this work and perform in parallel. As an added bonus, you're able to spin up this architecture uh, on demand on AWS and pay literally dollars uh, per hour so to get this job done, bring it down after it's finished, and uh, it's inexpensive. Um, so the thing that's important to know about it without going into much detail is that you have a nice abstraction there, which is a distributed data frame. And it turns out to be a pretty nice environment for joining multiple data sets because the data can be joined uh, and shuffled around. And the marketing version of that, which is all over uh, the Spark websites, is Unified Analytics Engine. And it's kind of true. Um, the other thing I'm going to mention in a second is an org format. The thing you should know about it is that it's a way of storing records that are paginated columnar. They are optimized for doing distributed reads and some form of distributed query. So a great way to get this into a Spark cluster uh, and is supported natively by Spark. The reason I am going to mention it now is that OSM records are available in this format uh, on AWS as part of their public data set program. Thanks to, I believe, Seth uh, Fitzsimmons right there. Uh, and uh, you can download uh, the whole planet, uh, planet including history and change sets, which I believe are the weekly rollups. Uh, this is pretty convenient because once you've done that, you can filter it down to the area that you're interested in. You have a cluster. Uh, if that's uh, too much work for you, you can go from a normal PBF extract to an org file for a specific area using OSM to work. Again, thanks to Seth. Uh, so that's what we're going to be using. That's how we're going to be consuming OSM. So let's unconfuse the slide. Uh, on the left is our mental model of what's going on. On the right is the thing that's happening. So we're going to load up all of these OSM records from an org file. They're going to be partitioned, uh, distributed amongst the workers. Great. Uh, on the right is me actually doing the thing in a terminal. Um, the thing to notice is that uh, I'm loading that org file with uh, one command. I'm sampling it to see what I got, and sure enough, uh, they're records. Uh, the subliminal message here is, is that a lot of the stuff to a point is going to be not that complicated, so perhaps uh, there is an interactive OSM analysis use case here that this isn't a great example of, but it's uh, one step removed from what's happening here. Uh, so once we have the ORC records, we see that they have a schema that corresponds to what we know and love, I suppose, that uh, ways have nodes, uh, relationship have ways, uh, and there's tags and change sets and so forth, uh, which is excellent, but not at all useful to us because that's not geometries. Uh, what we can do is use a library called uh, VectorPipe, uh, which will uh, join the ways to nodes, or rather the nodes to ways and the ways to relationship to rebuild these geometries in the cluster on the fly. So this is a shuffle step that happens. You don't know where all the nodes happen in your cluster. The workers figure out what needs to happen, join the geometries. And what you get back are actual points right there. Uh, if you are from the JVM world, uh, those are represented by a JTS uh, object, which is a very featureful uh, geometry library. And it's a user-defined type within this distributed data frame. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, we don't need points. That's all right. 
uh, using the data frame API and uh, some vector pipe helper functions. We kind of filter it. We want ways. We want things that say they're buildings. Let's see what we have. It's a simple transformation from one to the next. And uh, sure enough, we have polygons, right? We have building type. Most popular type is yes. There is even a house and three innovation way. Uh, this is an extract for Delaware that I did on my local machine. So I'm not sure where three innovation way is, but it sounds like a building. Uh, so, okay, so somewhere somewhere in the background, we loaded up the Bing dataset uh, from GeoJSON. That's not too interesting to talk about. We have it in a similar way. We have to figure out how to join them together. Uh, the story is, is that we do not have a robust spatial join in Spark. People keep talking about it. There's a couple of prototypes, and maybe it'll happen soon when somebody really wants it. Uh, but we have something that's nearly good enough. Uh, we can uh, grid our geometries, basically address them by these uh, tiles that they intersect, let's say at zoom level 12, which is what actually happened here. And uh, we're going to join the two data sets by those grid keys. Uh, that kind of looks like this, right? Uh, we're going to get multiple matches per key, but it's a small enough area that we don't have to be very smart at this point to continue the matching. And we just apply this logic, right? Possible matches of buildings that must intersect. Makes sense. Uh, if OSM contains the centroid of a Bing geometry, uh, yeah, that sounds good. Uh, if we have like a really weird building shape, we have like perhaps like uh, a croissant type of shape or like a half moon, uh, we can check for uh, the 75% area intersection. This is all from the JTS library I mentioned. None of this is like uh, tricky. And then, you know, you fail out in the end and say, yeah, I guess it's something weird I don't understand. We kind of developed this algorithm on the fly. It's not sophisticated, but it got us results. Uh, so I think there is something to be learned from that. Uh, and uh, once we do that, well, how the hell do we uh, actually get the nice web page that we have? We want to generate the vector tiles. Uh, and we have uh, two options to do that here. Uh, once we have uh, the match geometry, we can use this special thing that we made called vector pipe pipeline, uh, which allows you to define kind of like the select step to select the things you care about, the reduction step that basically says, well, if you zoom out a little bit, which geometries do I keep and how I transform them? Uh, and uh, then it has the code to actually write out the vector tiles in the map box uh, PBF format. Or we can just uh, save GeoJSON and use to pick a new. Uh, we did both. Uh, and uh, the reason we did both is because our first run of using our bespoke vector tile generator took four and a half hours over 20 machines for just California. And that's pretty awful. Uh, after some head scratching, we figured out that what was happening is in the reduction step, we're using an expensive function, the weighted centroid. And in subsequent jobs, we figured out a cheaper way to do it, and it worked just fine. Uh, but for this particular thing, we ended up using a tip of canoe after just dumping our matched geometries into GeoJSON. Uh, and this worked excellent. Uh, those are the timings. I don't know if they're the best possible, but they seem pretty good to me, considering that it took like, what, about 90 minutes to do this uh, for continental US with a couple of manual steps. Uh, and uh, obviously, putting that uh, web page together wasn't too much trouble either. Um, so actually, the... The steps right there where it does the decimations of uh, discarding the buildings as you go, go up the zoom levels were the most critical ones uh, to get lighter vector tiles as you zoom up, because otherwise it gets crazy. Um, does that mean that the previous vector pipe pipeline was completely useless? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, what you can't do with Tipa Canoe is really weird stuff. So here's just the an experiment, again by Seth, uh, of uh, trying to create an edit recency histogram and uh, basically having a map box vector tile with a slot, how many changes happened for this particular pixel in this month of uh, 2012 and so forth. Uh, the job for this ran, uh, it created map box vector tiles that were two megabytes large, so perhaps that wasn't the most optimal format for it. Uh, but it goes to show that you can, uh, come up with interesting and novel aggregations that you wouldn't have an option to do with um, Tipikunu because it is really 
centered around reducing geometries, as far as I can tell. Um, let's see. So, yeah, uh, that's the thing that we did. Uh, that's the demo again. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, I guess uh, the things uh, that I think here have legs, just to highlight them again, is the org format is a neat way to consume OSM in the distributed computing mode. Um, you should be at least aware of it. Uh, the Spark use case, the thing that I walked through, I think the thing that's remarkable about it is that it's not smart. It's basically key value joins, maps, and filters. And uh, you can kind of imagine how to iterate on this to do multiple other things. And uh, the vector pipe gives you uh, two interesting things, right? It reconstructs uh, the OSM geometries for you without using a PostGIS instance or Osmium. And it has the facilities to write out the actual vector tile from the cluster, which is pretty cool itself. Um, we'll see if the interactive OSM analysis ever happens, but it's possible because of that data frame concept that you have at least talked about. Uh, these are the links uh, to relevant repositories, and uh, this is more or less it. Um, are there any questions? Please. Uh, how do you deal with, when you look at, at the tile level, how do you deal with building the kind of process across two tiles and four tiles? Oh, yeah. So that's a good question. So uh, if we go back to our uh, tiling thing, right? Uh, we could have a building right on the tile boundary here. Uh, the answer is we address it for all the tiles that they intersect. So we get up to four duplicates. Uh, this turns out to be not much of a problem because computationally it's like eh on the cluster. And when you write out these as vector tiles, it's actually in the normal case that a building will be duplicated across uh, two neighboring vector tiles. And in the rendering step, they will be presented to you correctly. So you said the OSM uh, labels are generally a lot better around ordinary OSM cores. Were there places aside from the like crop circle type patterns where you saw the Microsoft buildings were consistently worse? Uh, so having spent about an hour just thinking that this is cool and uh, flipping through it, I did not. The Microsoft data set seems really impressive. Uh, that is not to say that there isn't areas, but they weren't obvious. Yeah. Uh, in Oregon, we noticed the crop circles uh, were in the first dump building, but they weren't in the second one. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that was true in other places as well. It seems to have been corrected. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so I guess the time step on this is, is about of a couple months ago when we ran this project. But I guess they figured out the issue with uh, the overlays. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Ahead of time. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>